Hello grade 10, welcome to your very first lesson in term 3. This is the most important work in accounting. So I'm going to emphasize in accounting because it's not just in grade 10. This is the most important work that you will start off with today in grade 10, 11 and 12 combined. So again, very, very important. So please pay attention. We're going to look at the concepts of the financial statements of the entity that you're busy with. Remember, you're still busy with the sole trader, the sole proprietor, the one-man show, the, the business that only has one owner. We're going to look at where do we start off with these statements that we need to compare. Now remember firstly, statements, we'll have the income statement and we'll have the balance sheet. So let's quickly go and write that down. So firstly, the income statement, very important, and then we'll have the balance sheet. And these are the two that we're going to look at during this year. Now again guys, we're not going to finish off with these two this year. What happens next year? We're going to look at another entity. And this entity is called a partnership. That's when we have two or more owners, up to 20 owners in the business. Now, I can promise you, if you know the income statement for the sole proprietor, you will know the income statement for a partnership because there's no difference. It's exactly, exactly the same. So save you all the trouble for next year. Do the work this year because we have time this year. We have enough time to go over the statement thoroughly. We're going to look at it in great detail so that you find it easier in grade 11. And then grade, in grade 12, we're going to look at a company. Again, the same income statement will be drawn up but just two extra lines will be added to that income statement. Again, if you know your income statement that you're starting off with now, you know it for grade 11 and for grade 12. So a lot easier for you in future, study it now, do it now. If you can do it now, why do it later? When there's more work to revise, more work to practice, more work to do. Again, build the foundation as strong as you can, especially with the concepts. Why do we do it? What do you need to look out for? And that's what we're going to cover for this week. Um, now again, what you need to know is the adjustments that we did last term. All those final adjustments and then we did the closing transfers. This is very similar work. The adjustments don't fall away. We're still going to have them. So we still need to adjust the figures to draw up the financial statements for the year. So let's quickly see why do we need to do this. Now firstly, all expenses and income must be recorded in a financial period and that is normally 12 months any consecutive 12 months so we can start the 1st of March and end then 28 February the next year that will be 12 months so know that we are matching and that's a core principle all your income and all your expenses for a particular year to that year because we're going to firstly look at the income statement for the first part of term three then we're going to go over to the balance sheet and then after that we're going to interpret these things again if you just draw up these statements it doesn't say a lot you need to go look into these statements and then do a few calculations and with that you will see is this company or business profitable or not but let's quickly go further the GAAP principle again matching is used again match all the income and all the expenses to a particular year. I'm not saying match the receipt and payments to a particular year. Again, I don't really care on when did I pay? Did I pay too much? Did I pay? I don't care about paying and receiving it. I'm caring about what is my income for this year and what is my expenses for this year. If we live in a perfect world, we'll receive when we need to receive and we'll pay when we will pay or need to pay. So know that. And then if you know this matching principle, it will make your life a lot easier when we start looking at the statements and the adjustments. Now, adjustments are made at the end of every year so that the financial statements are accurate. And again, not just one company will do it, not just one sole trader will do it, all businesses will do it. And not just in South Africa. Remember, we have the IFRS, the International Financial Reporting Standard. So there's a certain standard set that all businesses use, in most countries use the standards to set up their statements at the end of every year. But let's continue. So remember, accounts like the accrued income, the accrued expenses, the prepaid expenses, and income received in advance are created for this purpose. Now, I still hope that you can identify which of those 
are assets and which are liabilities. Remember, sometimes we owe on an expense. We didn't pay everything and that will be called an accrued expense. But then we may, might prepay something. So we might pay in advance. Maybe we're paying in, uh, insurance for six months in advance. What happens now? If we're not happy with this insurance company, we have the right to cancel our insurance at that company. And if we cancel it and we don't have insurance at that company anymore, but we prepaid for six months, they owe us money. So that money is then owed to us and that will be an asset. Now let's look at the income again. If we have something called accrued income, it means that we didn't receive all the income yet. And someone owes income to this business. And if you look at income received in, adv uh, in, in advance, again, income res was received before we should have received it. So let's say a tenant paid for two months before um, the, the, the period that actually occurred. So that's maybe two months next year already. What happened? He paid in advance. But let's say his business closes down or he wants to move out. He's not happy with it the premises anymore, we need to pay him back those months he prepaid. So again, then we as business owe that company or individual. So let's continue with our work today. I want to leave you with a question quickly. Do you remember all the GAR principles that are in use when the statements are drawn up? And I want you to name all six of them. So you need to draw down all six GAR principles because all six GAR principles are connected somewhere in the financial statement. So again, you need to know these and the better you know them, the better you can implement these GAR principles in your statements. So I'm going to give you two minutes to quickly answer this. Okay, guys, let's look at these six GAR principles. I hope you can remember them because we did use them again in previous terms. Now, let's look at the first one, your historical cost. Now, I'd like to just ask you, if you paid 5,000 Rand for a cell phone and that cell phone is two years old, it's not worth 5,000 anymore. But my question is, what did you pay for that cell phone? And your answer should be, I paid 5,000 Rand for it. So that's the historical cost. The historical cost price is you paid 5,000 Rand for the phone, and that's how it will be recorded in the, say, equipment ledger account in the general ledger. Let's look at the next one. Your business entity. Can you remember what that means? Again, business entity means... I need to keep everything separate from that of the owner and that of the business. So say the business pays out of the business's bank account for the owner's insurance and for his rent and maybe his uh, water and electricity, his telephone, that will all be recorded under drawings. So we need to see 
the owner takes stock or cash, it will also be recorded as drawings to see how much did the owner take, how much was his total drawing. So again, all the expenses of that of the owner is kept separate from that of the business. Hopefully you understand that and remember that. The next one, prudence. Again, prudence means I'm going to be conservative. I'm going to take the worst case scenario. Again, where will I find this one? Again, when stock is missing. If stock is missing, I can't say I have the stock and I can't trace the stock anymore. I need to take that stock out of my books, so therefore it will have an effect on your trading stock, but also you are making a loss. You're having a trading stock deficit, you are losing stock, and therefore it's recorded as an expense. You need to record that carefully and nicely in the income statement as well. The next one, your materiality. Now materiality is a tricky one because materiality, what is material to the business and what's not? What is material for the readers of the statements and what's not? So am I as a business owner or the bookkeeper going to list every single expense for the year separately? And if you want to do that, you're going to use a lot of paper because now I can't really say what is what. So you can't have like 10 T accounts for stationery. You can't have a T account for pens and one for pencils, one for uh, rulers, one for maybe staplers and whiteboard markers, one for paper, one for ink. Do you see? It creates a little bit havoc in your income statements. Again, combine all of that together and call it stationery. So therefore, material for that business will be just to have one T account called stationery. But then maybe a school or a big printing company, they would want to keep the ink and the paper and all those things separate. They want to see how much do I actually spend on paper and on stationery. Now guys, the other tier account will then be stationery. So know what is material and what's not for business. Again, you want to make these statements readable, easily readable. So you can go and look at it and identify what expense is this, what expense is that, what can be included in this expense or that expense. So no materiality. It's a tricky one, but if you can read it carefully and interpret it wisely, then you'll be fine. The next one, going concern. Now this one is connected to my statements. When I set up an income statement and a balance sheet, I take into consideration that this business won't close down in the next year or is not closing down now. So it is going on. So mostly, or actually 99.9% .9 of the time, when you do the statements, the business will continue. You won't get this question like, set up the statements because the business is closing down. You won't get a question like that. So just know that there's a different procedure when a business is not going on when the statements are drawn up. And now the last one, your matching principle. Now what is your matching principle? Again, very, very important for your income statement. Again, I looked at it earlier today. Your matching is you need to match all your income and all your expenses to a particular year. So if it should have been paid this year, you'll include it. If you overpaid and you paid for next year already, you need to take it out. So know the matching principle when you look at the income statement. But let's continue. Key concepts that you need to know as well is that we have statements and these are drawn up for financial period. So let's quickly look at it. A period is normally 12 months, so I want to underline that it's normally 12 months in which the financial position of the business is determined. And what do I normally do? I like to draw a nice timeline like that, and with this timeline I will put the beginning of the year there, and I put the end of the year there. And as you can see, the end of this year is 29 February 2016, and the beginning of the year is 1 March 2015. Now guys, if you go and count the months, you will see very easy, you start at March, you count 12 months, and then you'll get to February. So let's quickly leave you with a question. Determine the beginning of the financial period in each of the following cases. And I'm giving you these to answer over the ad break. So let's quickly look at the date of the end of the financial period. So quickly draw down the end of the financial period. The end is the 28th of February, 2015. The next one is the 31st of June, 2011. And then the next one is 31 December, 2008. And remember, this is the end of the year. So you now need to get to the beginning of the year. So there's a tip. If I have at the end of the year, always look at the next day. And then when I look at the end of the year's year, 
always go one back. But now you need to remember that if I give you the end year, December, I might not need to go a year back. So quickly answer these three. I hope you jotted them down and I'll give you the answers after the ad break. Okay guys, let's see if you can determine your financial years. Again, very important, you need to be able to determine the year. If you can't determine the year, you're not going to be able to do the adjustments to the best of your ability. So firstly, 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 check what year am I currently busy with. Now, if I look at this, the end of the year is 28 February 2015. So therefore, the next day will be the 1st of March. And then the beginning of the year will be 2014. If you count from the 1st of March 2014 to 28 February 2015, you will see it's 12 months. The next one. The next day will be the 1st of July, the previous year, 2010, and there you have it. But now this one, what is the next day after 31 December? It's the 1st of January, but you will still stay in the year 2008. Why? Because if you count from the 1st of January, 2008, to 31 December, 2008, you get a perfect full year. Now remember, this doesn't happen all the time. This is normally used in grade 11 when you look at sports clubs. But now, after these, Let's see if you can get to the end date. So again, let's look at the question. Determine the beginning. I just want to fix this. It should not be beginning. It should be the end. The end of the financial period in each of the following cases. And again, here's your column for the end period. Guys, let's look at it. So I know you got them right because we just did it now, just the other way around. So you should find this a little bit easier. Let's look at it. So if I tell you the beginning of March 2015, what is the previous day? The previous day is 28 February, but then the next year will be 2016. And now remember, sometimes there's a leap year, sometimes not. We're not too fussed about it. If you want to say the 29th, if you want to say the 28th, not too important. Just know that it's the end of February with a certain year. Now again, 1 July 2010, the previous day is 30 June, but then the next year should be 2011. And then this is the easy one. If we start on the 1st of January, we will end on the 31st of December, and this is not correct. It needs to be 2014, because it's not two years, it is only one year. So be careful when you do the one for January. Because if you count to the next year, like in the example, 
you're going to count two years. So from the 1st of January 2014 to 31 December 2014, that's 12 months. Not 31 December 2015. So hopefully you'll know that. Let's continue. Again, very important. The year process. Let's look at the year process. So what do I need to do before I get to the statements? Now, if you don't know this, you need to get this correct. You need to go and study it because if you don't know the process, you don't know where to fit everything into the final year process. So let's look at it. The year in procedure is what? We need to do the pre-adjustment trial balance. And this is the first thing we will do. What is a pre-adjustment trial balance? It's before any adjustments took place. So what we'll do is we'll do a normal trial balance. It's just now called a pre-adjustment trial balance. And that means we didn't adjust any figures with any adjustments yet. So what do we do with the second step? The second step is we need to adjust. So adjustments we need to do now. And these adjustments will be put into the general journal. And then we'll need to post the general journal to the general ledger. So know that. Now after we've done this, we'll set up another trial balance. Now again, we want to check, is your debits equaling your credits? with these trial balances. And what do we do now? We will have a post adjustment trial balance. And that's your step number three. Number four will now be your closing transfers. And I was actually emphasizing these closing transfers a lot in term two because they are so important if you know these closing transfers it makes your life a lot easier when you could go to the income statement and need to draw up the full income statement again the closing transfers remember there's seven steps hopefully you know all of them if you know them great you'll find the income statement a lot easier so after these closing transfers what do we do we are going to do the final accounts and hopefully you can still remember these accounts it will be the trading account and the profit and loss account. And remember, your trading account will be, I'm trading, I'm buying and I'm selling. So I'll have your sales and your cost of sales in there, but your profit and loss will then have your trading account and all your other income and all your other expenses listed in this profit and loss account. And then what do I do after that? I have a post-closing trial balance. And post-closing means I closed off all the nominals, all the nominal accounts are closed off, and another one, your drawings from your balance section. Your balance sheet section will have drawings. It needs to close off to capital. And then remember, all your income and expenses are now closed off. And your profit and loss, your final, final account. So F2, your profit and loss account will close off to your capital. Because remember, this business is generating a profit for the owner. And this money, the profit that he didn't take yet will go to his capital account and that will be seen as an investment into the business and that might, money might be used to grow the business. And then we're getting to what we need to. Number seven, now we can set up the income statement and the balance sheet. And these two statements, again, guys, I'm going to emphasize formats. So a lot of teachers don't let you write tests every day on these formats. In my class, my learners write a test every day just on a certain format. Again, if you know the format, you can't go wrong and you can't fail this work. Remember, the adjustments are difficult. Some of you are struggling with them. But again, the more you practice them, the easier you'll get and you'll find them. But if you get one or two adjustments wrong, you can still get an A for the section in any exam. So now, who looks at these statements? Again, you're drawing them up for a particular reason. Someone wants to look at them. So let's quickly look at it. The statements are the best and easiest way to see how much profit this business has made. And there's quite a lot of uses for these statements. So let's look at the very first one. Number one, the owner. Again, if you own a business and you're the only owner of this business, don't you want to see at the end of every year what did I get? What profit did I make? How many assets do I have in this business? Do I have a lot of liabilities? And these are all questions that the owner can ask when he looks at the statements. Again, you're starting off a year in school and at the end of the year, you'll get a final report to show what did you do this year? 
And then you can look at it. Are you happy with it? Did you increase your mark from last year to this year in certain subjects? Did you perform better? Didn't you? Why didn't you? What can you do to improve maybe? And this is why the owner needs the statement as well. So he needs to firstly ask, is this profitable? And he can ask a question. Is it a good investment? Again, do you want to run a business and have a lot of input into this business, you work a lot, you work hard to get this business going and make it a success, but your return is not great. Again, we're going to look at this at the end of term three. So start thinking about it. If you're an investor, do you want to rather invest in a fixed deposit? Do you want to buy shares in a company with the money you have? Do you want to maybe buy a property? What do you want to do with money? Or like this, the owner started a business, but then you need to go and check. Is this a good business? Is it profitable? Can't you rather sell the business, take the money and go and invest it somewhere else to get a better return? So that's one. Let's go look further. The second one will be the banks and the financial institutions. And why? Why do we need to show them my statements? Again, if you want need a loan, where are you going to get this money? You're going to get this money from any bank or financial institution. So they won't just borrow money to ever they think, needs it. You need to go and prove to them and say, look here, this is my statement. My business is profitable. I can make a better profit if you borrow me a bit of money and I can buy maybe an extra delivery vehicle or I can buy more machinery or more equipment. So this is very important for banks to see what is going on in this business. Don't they already have a lot of loans? If they don't, they might borrow you. If they see that you have overextended on a loan, they're not going to borrow you any more money. Let's look at another one. And this is a similar one, and we're going to look at it. Creditors. The creditor must know whether the business is credit worthy. Is the business able to pay their debts? Now again, a creditor, someone you owe money to, you have to go to their business and you ask for credit, you do all the forms, but you also sometimes need to give proof of, is this business profitable? Do you have too many debts? Do you have too little debts? What's happening in the business? And then the creditor can make an informed decision to see, can I borrow him more? Can I give him more goods on credit? What can I do to assist this business? Or what should I stop doing to help this business? Another one, SARS, the South African Revenue Service. Now why? Remember, a one-man show, one owner business, a sole trader, they will generate a profit and that profit belongs to the owner. Now remember, this money that's belonging to the owner is generating it through the year. He needs to pay a certain percentage on that over to SARS. So he will be taxed on some of that profit. And SARS wants to know, how much profit did you make? So that I, as SARS, know how much to tax you at the end of every month or every year. Let's go look at the next one. Potential buyers. Now, why do they want to look at the statements of a company? Again, potential buyers wants to see is this business profitable? Is it a good investment? Do they have a lot of assets, little liabilities? Do they have too many liabilities? Then they can ask questions about, is this business a good investment or not? And where will they pick it up? In the statements. So again, very important for them. But now, I want to give you a minute to quickly look at this question. Name any other users of the financial statements of a sole trader. Now again, guys, there can be many. So I'm going to require from you to maybe draw down two or three. So therefore your minutes will start now. Okay, guys, I hope you could name at least two or three. Let's look at them. Unions, the managers of a business, 
potential partners of a business. Again, that can be, be uh, investors or the suppliers. Again, maybe a supplier don't want to be connected to a business uh, for a certain reason. Maybe that business is uh, supplying inferior quality goods. They want to supply to you because they might get a bad name. Unions, they want to go and bargain with the owner of this business and say, listen, you're making a good profit here. Let's Let's reward the workers in the business as well. And then potential partners, again, if you want to expand and the bank doesn't want to give you a loan, again, it's connected to investors. Again, a potential partner is then you are branching out, you're increasing your, your business, you're growing your business with not just the investor, but a partner as well. Let's go on with the concepts of financial statements. Now, guys, when we look at the income statement, you need to know three things. That we have income and expenses and they are broken into three main sections. Let's look at them. The first one will be your operating section. The second one will be your financing. And then lastly, your investing. Now, these are the three main groupings of all income and expenses. Now again, operating means, how do I go on day to day? So again, I need to operate within a business. I need to be operating at a good profitable way. How do I do it? I need to minimize my expenses. I need to increase my income. But again, you need to remember, I can't just have no expenses. I need to have rent. I need to put electricity. I need to advertise, stuff like that. But now, investing. Investing stands outside of your operations, your day-to-day -day activities. So when you invest, the business can invest into a fixed deposit or into other businesses, and that will be outside of the business's day-to-day -day operating activities, and they will normally get a dividend or they'll get interest on the fixed deposit. So all interests received, easy for you to learn, will be then financing. Sorry, Investing, just let's quickly, all the interest that you receive will be investing, but then the financing will be all the interests paid. So when you have a loan and you need to pay interest, again, that loan is maybe used to buy a vehicle. Yes, you use the vehicle within the business, but you finance it through the bank and you need to pay them interest. And that's interest expenses, and that again stands outside of your day-to-day -day operations. So guys, we'll continue and look at a few adjustments and the income statement at the end of this next session. Okay guys, so again, your three main topics, our previous session, we looked at the three main groupings of your income and expenses. Now I'm going to ask you to quickly jot down a few examples for me. So let's look at it. Provide examples for each of the following. I want operating, investing, and then financing income and expenses. Now I'm going to give you two minutes to quickly draw down as many as you can in that two minutes. Your two minutes starts now.
Okay, guys, let's look at the answer. Now, I know that I've listed a few that I like. You might have listed a few different ones. Again, check them. Ask yourself, do I use it within the business daily or not? Is the operating expense, or financing or investing? Let's look at them. So the first one, the operating, is when you buy and sell goods. So that is when you have your sales, your trading, uh, your, your, your cost of sales, your debtors allowances, your water electricity. I've listed advertising, your rent, your discounts received and discounts allowed, your water electricity, telephone, stationery, packing material, depreciation, trading stock deficit. All of those things will be part of operational and the list can go on and on. So your investing, that will be a little bit at the bottom, all interests received. So you can have your interest on overdue accounts that you charge on your debtors. You can have your interest on your current account. You can have interest on a fixed deposit. So all those interests will form together the investing part of your income statement. And then lastly, your financing. You can have interest on overdraft, interest on a loan, interest on mortgage loan. All of those items again listed under your financing. How do I finance my business? Sometimes with a loan. Just like when you buy a house or a car, you finance that through a loan from the bank. So what do we need to look at now is how do I calculate different things? And again, if you can calculate these things, you will find the income statement easier. Let's look at the first one. Number one, your sales. How do I calculate sales? Again, remember with your closing chances, I closed off a certain figure to the sales account. So I'm going to quickly jot down for me the formula to calculate your net sales. I'll give you one minute. Okay, guys, I gave you a clue. Hope you have a try. It. There's the answer. So the net sales is sales minus your debtors' allowances. So again, how do I get my net sales? I have cash sales plus your credit sales minus your debtors' allowances, and there you have. This is your sales amount. Now remember, when I look at these income statements. Or on your balance sheet, actually, you need to show everything in brackets. So another one, your gross profit. How do I calculate gross profit? I want to give you one minute. So guys, gross profit, easy. You take your sales minus your cost of sales. Very easy. Now, in my class, we normally share the workload. Let's look at gross operating income. How do I do gross operating income? I need to take my gross profits and I take all my other operating income and I add the two to get your gross 
operating income. Now, how do I get the operating profit? I just take the gross operating income minus your operating expenses, and then you get your operating profit. Now, interest income, how do I get that? You have to add all the different interests. You add them up, you get it together, and that will be your interest income. The next one, your profit before interest expense. Very easy. You take your operating profit plus your interest income to get your profit before interest expense. And then, your expenses, it is shown separately. Remember, all your interest expenses needs to be shown at the bottom of your income statement. And then the last one, your net profit, very easy. Your profit before interest expense minus your interest expense. Now, let's look at a few adjustments quickly again. Now, know these adjustments, the better you know them, the more you practice them, the easier in the income statement and the balance sheet. So let's look at the first one. So we looked at trading stock deficits and trading stock surpluses and this is when we lose trading stock or when we have a surplus. So maybe we sold something and the customer never collected it and therefore we have a surplus. So know that a surplus will, will be regarded as an income. We are winning there but if we lose stock we are losing. It will be a trading stock deficit and it will be regarded as an expense. The next one, consumable stores on hand. You still need to know what is consumable stores on hand. Those are items at the end of the year like your stationery, your paper, packing material, cleaning material, everything that I use within a company or a business that I didn't use yet, but I use it not for selling purposes. I use it to make the operations a little bit easier within the business. So therefore I'm more fluent, I have a clean office, I have coffee and tea, I have paper. The stuff that I don't use yet, I will only use it next year and therefore it will be regarded as an expense for next year. Another one, the one you love, depreciation. Now remember depreciation, the value that I lose on all vehicles and equipment. And there's two methods, the cost price method and the diminishing balance method. Know it, the better you know both methods again, the easier, distinguish between them. No, there's a few names for each one. Then if you continue on this list, bad debts, bad debts and expense again. That is when you sold on credit to someone, but you didn't maybe have all the information for that person and now you can't trace them. Or it's maybe a person that lost their job and can't pay you anymore. The thing is you can take people to court, but if they don't have money to pay you, you're not going to get that money. So if it's a smaller amount, rather write them off because the legal fees will be a lot higher than just to take this client or debtor to court to say you need to pay me the 100 rand. Remember uh, a lawyer will ask you a lot more than 100 rand for all the legal advice and the letters etc. Now another one, your bad debts recovered. Now that is when this debtor after a year felt bad and he came back into this business and said, please, I feel bad, I have a job now again, I'm back on my feet, and I owed you 100 Rand, so therefore I'm going to pay you this 100 Rand. But remember, guys, this is not regarded as a debtor anymore because this person was written off. He was taken out of the books. So therefore, it is a bad debt recovered. The next one, errors and omissions. So this can be anything, guys. When you pick up any mistakes within the general ledger or in the journal, you need to fix it. So you will have to fix it. You normally fix all of these items in the general journal and you'll fix it and show the true reflection. Remember, we, there's certain standards we need to, uh, to do these with. Another one, accrued income. Accrued income, again, it's receivable. Income not received yet. We looked at it earlier today. Income received in advance or deferred income. Deferred income is we owe money because we received it too soon and we received it ready for next year. So it should be only shown in next year statements. Another two, the expenses prepaid. If we prepay, we need to take it out for this year because we only need this expense or have this expense next year. So therefore, someone owes me temporarily. And then the next one will be your accrued expenses or expenses payable. And therefore, we didn't pay yet, we still owe, and that we need to pay hopefully early in the next year because we already use the service or we already use the water, electricity, whatever we owe on that expense. So, 
let's go to what I need you to study. So a little bit of homework today, guys. Let's look at the income statement, but I'm not going to just brush through it. I'm going to go through it in detail because I need you to study it. Again, the best way to know it is write it out as many times as you can or until you know it or for heart. Again, you won't get marks for the wording per se, but you will get marks when you use the format correctly. So let's look at it. So we can study this format of the income statement and I will highlight the, the line entries that will stay the same. For example, sales will always be at the top. Now again, how do we get the sales? We say net sales. How do we get the net sales? I say your, all your sales minus your debtors allowances and that will give you a sales amount. Now it will always be at the top and you always need to minus your cost of sales from your sales to then get your gross profit. Now you can see that I've placed cost of sales in a nice bracket. Now remember, brackets means minus. You need to study it. If this amount is not in a bracket but it's the right amount, some teachers won't give you the mark. It needs to be in a bracket to show that you take your sales minus your cost of sales to get to then the gross profit here. Then what do I do next? And as you can see, closing transfer step one, two, and three already done. Now we're going to look at step number four. Your operating prof, uh, your oper uh, other operating income again. Very easy. All your incomes except your interest, guys, will be listed here. So we'll list your discount received, your rent income, for example, your bad debt recovered, and this list can go on. We'll place it all in a nice block like that. And then we'll add it up. So we add all of this to get to your other operating income. And then what do I do? I take these two amounts and then again I add them to get to your gross operating income. Now what do I do now? Step number five, I list all my other operating expenses here. And these two lines will always be here. But now your expenses here can differ. I can use this expense first, this one second. It depends on the expenses of the sole trader. You can just list them. And again, if you do the adjustments, you'll do them in brackets like that. But again, list all your expenses like this in a nice block as shown. We can have 10, we can have 20, we can have 30. And then again, remember, expenses are bad. It eats up my profit. So what do I do? I say gross operating income minus your operating expenses. And this will then give you your operating profit or loss. Now what do I do next? I list my interest income and I take this plus this. So I add these two to get to my answer profit before interest expense. I minus again my expense for interest and then I get my net profit or loss for the year at the end. Now guys again study, study, study. Study the format. The better you know the wording the better your term three in accounting will be. Now guys, I'll see you next week when we touch on adjustments again before we start off with a full income statement. Practice hard and I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.